it looks has become a standard that I introduced the speaker, so I introduced E. Fatila, E. Stead for Elizabeth, and uh, he grad, she grad, sorry, <laughs> she grad, she graduated from University of, how you pronounce, Galu? Uh, Guelph. 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 Guelph, uh, University of Guelph, undergraduate in chemistry, got a PhD in chemistry, I remember everything, <laughs> and uh, had a postdoc in chemistry at Berkeley, then also in chemistry at University of Indiana, and of course she came here as a professor in chemistry. <laughs> so this is a talk about chemistry of the nuclear bombs. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Semicidic. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna be talking today about criticality and um, a great example from the Manhattan era is uh, Project Era is the Demon Core. Uh, now, one of the things is you may have noticed that I am a chemistry professor and I have chemistry training. But I will say this nuclear stuff is really cool, and especially because it is so dangerous and we can't see it, taste it, smell it. Although you will see that there may be a taste associated uh, with one of these accidents. So I'm going to show you why would people even bother doing such a dangerous experiment in the first place, under what conditions, what they knew at the time, a little bit about the historical context of the nuclear age, right? And of course, we're going to have to look at that and see how the chemistry affected how they had to study these systems as well. Um, and again, some of the biological effects of radiation that were learned from these studies, okay? And even looking at some other criticality accidents that did not involve the demon core but did occur at Los Alamos after the fact. Okay. So I did some uh, photos at, there, there's not enough color here, so I was like, you know what, what could I do at home that could recreate this? And so I was like, you know what, I make guacamole a lot, so I was like, it makes sense, avocado can pretty much do that. Now what I will say though, is that this doesn't give justice how, how small this was. It was only like 3.6 inches wide or something. Uh, so it's pretty tiny. So I should have found one where we uh, won the avocado lottery. That would have been a better example. All right. So let's just let's just go to what is this talk about? Could I have renamed it something else other than playing with catalytic in the demon core? Yes, I could have. I could have called it two physicists go into a room to study a shiny metal ball and end up dead. Okay, so that's <laughs> what happened. And I know that sounds. I do not mean to make light of this. They were aware of the dangers. They were the experts at the time but how really smart people can do very stupid things. All right, I mean, really, seriously. Um, so why did this come about? Okay, so at this point when they were in the Manhattan Project, so this was post, you know, the war had ended when these accidents occurred. Um, so we look at a nuclear reaction as a chemist, this is something uh, unusual for me. We look at these particles called neutrons, and in chemistry we don't really care about them. We care about electrons. And we care about effective nuclear charge, which, are, which is really our protons. We may talk about neutrons in terms of isotopes, but they're not really a big thing in chemistry as much. But a neutron can actually collide with the nucleus and cause a diffusion and break off other, uh, other elements, essentially. Okay? And physicists, if I say anything wrong or incorrectly, feel free to correct me. But in the same time, what that can also do is generate new neutrons and break up other atoms as well. And this is what we call a chain reaction. Okay? So the energy release is equal to mc squared. So we all know we have the conservation of energy and we, get, we have the conservation of mass. So these are related by this, this equation from Einstein. Now to give you a perspective on how a nuclear reaction compares to a chemistry reaction, or a chemical reaction, 170 mega electron volts per atom or 10 to the seven times that for an ordinary combustion reaction. So a whole lot of energy from this. And so it won't be surprising when I show you some of the history of this, why, um, Pretty much after you know the neutron was discovered, it's like, hey, how do we make a bomb out of this? Pretty much was the first thing thought up. Okay, so here's again just kind of someone playing with criticality. Uh, know your meme. We're going to show that at the end as well because this has actually become a recent topic of interest. So at the time, even after the bomb was dropped, they were still interested in what is the number of new neutrons created from each fission, new, the neutron multiplication number. This had been figured out for uranium and somewhat for plutonium, but they were still actually wanting to see some tests. And the test was determined when you would reach a critical mass. So everyone's familiar with a critical mass, right? Like everyone's heard the term before, and of course I'd expect the part of <coughs> physics, right? Physicists to say such a, to know such a thing. So basically what happens is if you have a neutron and you generate more neutrons um, 
but they are lost, so the number of neutron, new neutrons is less than the number lost, you're subcritical. Okay? So we say that K is less than 1. A critical mass is when the number of new neutrons created is exactly equal to those that are lost, so you reach kind of a steady state. That's K equals 1. And a supercritical mass, which as you can imagine, if you want something that goes kaboom, right, is what you really want. Okay? And that's going to be a K greater than 1. You're actually creating more neutrons than what are lost. Okay? And so there's a whole lot of engineering, chemistry, and of course physics that went into <coughs> using this to make a powerful weapon. So let's look at a brief history. And I find it interesting. So the first thing that I thought to put up, like, where do I start from, right? Because it's like Chem 100, we talk about the discovery of cathode rays and stuff like that, artificial, uh, of radioactivity, all that kind of stuff, right? So Röntgen rays, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but really, I kind of zeroed in on the neutron being discovered by James Chadwick, right? So it's really interesting. Um, I'll show you a resource after that I looked at, but it was a very interesting story of how they discovered this, and it will actually explain some of the features we see in later slides during the criticality accidents. Artificial radioactivity, so that's Irene Julia Curie and Pierre, I think is her husband's name, I can't remember. Okay. Um, so her husband's name, they were dealing with artificial reactivity, as well as one of my favorites, Enrico Fermi, who doesn't love Fermi. Um, uh, they were also then start to look at neutron bombardment, so that's what also Enrico Fermi was doing at that time as well. He believed he had discovered plutonium, but he had actually discovered fission and didn't realize it at the time. Uh, he also discovered beta decay at this time as well, which is going to come up later as well. Um, this is Lisa Meitner and uh, Otto Hahn. There's so many autos that I kind of get mixed up with that, but he's a chemist and she's a physicist and they had a fruitful collaboration since like 1912. So they've been working for a long time. Um, and they were also interested in, in neutron bombardment as well. So in 1938-1939, um, Otto Hahn and Strassmann actually did the experiments and Lisa Meitner was not to be in the country because of oh something that was happening around this time. Um, and her and her nephew actually figured out the results of their experiments. So like oh you're getting fission. And so that was published in Nature, so that was a huge deal. And I just want to show you this because how things accelerate, just like a supercritical math, <laughs> when you get supercriticality, right? Things just accelerated like crazy. Irene Joliet Curie and her husband, they found the value of neutrons per fission. It was published that it could, in fact, maintain a supercritical state, so it was more neutrons could come out than went in. That was 1939. That was a, they had a slightly higher than actual value that it should have been. Now, these two faces, some students in 281 may recognize, and just to show you how huge this whole project was, this is W.L. Bragg from the Bragg equation and G.P. Thompson, son of J.J. Thompson. So he did electron diffraction, x-ray diffraction. They combined forces, and they had said, hey, how about using uranium for these bombs? So that's pretty cool that it was actually, you know, some people we think about in terms of more chemistry, but they were, of course, also physicists that actually suggested uranium. That was 1939, continuing 1939. Eugenio Curie and uh, Enrico Fermi were both working on studies, but they were using uranium oxide to try to get critical mass. Um, there's also a lot of stuff. So these are some great resources that, again, gave me a lot of chance to do uh, a lot of reading. And there was stuff that was published that, especially Leo Szilard, was not really happy with being published for reasons at this time, okay? Because it was a very volatile time in Europe. Now, the thing is, is that George Plachek, who is here, right, he actually left Czechoslovakia. He was actually escaping Stalin. So, hey, someone who was finally not uh, trying to escape Hitler, uh, he basically discovered that, hey, if you have the right shape, size, and moderator, you can, in fact, get supercriticality and you can get a bomb. And by that point, just a little after that, so September 1st, 1939, we know that uh, Germany invaded Poland. Okay, so World War II started kicking off, uh, basically. So that's just in seven years. We went from, hey, this new particle was discovered to, hey, you know, we're pretty much close to making a bomb. Yes. Uh, what does it mean by moderator? Ah, moderator. So that's something that slows neutrons down. I got that right, physicist, right? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so then um, 1940, the next year, so this is Zillard, by the way, and Enrico Fermi was, they were thinking, hey, we can use graphite as a moderator for a pile. To, it also reflects back neutrons as well. Um, we'll see the effects of that later. Um, but uh, he wanted to publish, and he said no. 
do not publish this because the Germans are on us, right? So Germans weren't using graphite. Germans were interested in heavy water, right? And so that actually comes into play. That's one of the reasons why the Germans fell so far behind. But that same year, a new element was discovered, and that was Neptunium. Okay, so Neptunium actually get from bombarding uranium-238, which is the most common isotope of uranium, so about 99.3% of all natural uranium is 238 uranium. Bombarded with a neutron, you get 239 uranium, but that's actually not very stable. And it was actually theorized by people that this was actually happening before, <coughs> that you're actually getting a beta decay, so you actually you lose um, also an electron and an antineutrino. So it basically is taking a neutron and converting it to a proton. Okay, so you get neptunium, that's also not very stable, and it was actually, uh, someone else suggested that this is actually gonna convert also to a higher um, Z element as well, and indeed it does through beta decay, goes from a neutron to a proton, and you increase in um, Z to now 239 plutonium. So 239 plutonium should seem familiar to all of you, as that is also used in nuclear bombs, okay? Um, so plutonium was discovered in February 1941. Okay, so not that long later. First observation of neutrons from fission, March, the next month. Okay, so we're moving really fast now. One microgram of plutonium isolated, uh, August 20th, 1942. Now we're going in terms of days. Okay, that was from cyclotron um, studies that they were doing, I think at Berkeley at the time, with Macmillan. So that's Macmillan, that's Abelson who discovered neptunium. This is uh, Ed Macmillan and Ed Seaborg who discovered plutonium. 2.77 micrograms of plutonium weighed. We're way far away from a bomb, right? Like, <laughs> we're not even close yet. We don't have enough material. At that time as well, though, um, the Chicago pile experiment, right? So the famous one that happened under uh, at Chicago, right, by Enrico Fermi, where they're using graphite as moderator. That was December 2nd, 1942. They found the, a more accurate value for the, uh, the value of neutrons per fission, right, for uranium-235. Spring 1944, now we're getting towards the crescendo of the war. Grams of 239 plutonium from Clinton, Tennessee, AKA Oak Ridge, were sent to Los Alamos. And by 1945, kilograms of plutonium from Hanford went to Los Alamos. So you can see from just in a few years, right, we went from just discovering an element to making kilograms of this stuff. And I'm gonna talk more about this later, but the important thing to remember is that this is a new element, period. Right? So there's a ton of unknowns. Forget just the physics, but the chemistry of it, all of its properties, you have no idea. And you've got to machine this into a super weapon, essentially. Okay? So that brings us to criticality. So, to thir to, so uranium was already posited as being one. Plutonium is another one that they're clearly very interested in. So how can you get criticality from something subcritical? Because especially at this time, who knows if this is enough? So you can always add more fissile material. Well, that's easier said than done, because look how much effort, and you'll see how much the bomb, each bomb costs. It's crazy. Um, that's not very easy. Compress it sounds great. That's what we'll use when we actually explode the device. And finally, the third, you can use something to reflect neutrons back into the core. And so this is often described as a tamper of the nuclear weapon. And there's two types. And I, I, I like this because of the chemical diversity we have. Right, so we have a nice light element like beryllium, right, which is a nu neutron reflector, and tungsten in the form of tungsten carbide, which is also a neutron reflector, and I also believe a moderator as well. And so this is very light, <coughs> transparent to x-rays, and this is heavy, okay? So you got two different, very fla different flavors for different types of weapons, right? So we have some versatility here. Okay. I also wanna point out this source is the server primer. So 1943, right, Oppenheimer had one of his former students basically give a debriefing, like what pros progress have we made so far in the weapons? And he has handwritten calculations for the number of neutrons released. What's the critical mass they need? What's this rate? What's a, why is a sphere better than a cube? Like in handwritten notes right on there. It's very cool, you can download it. Okay, so there's gonna be a group, right, that was going to come together and basically say, how, how do we design Get, uh, designed these bombs to get criticality. And so that was the critical assembly group at Los Alamos. So the group leader was Otto Frisch, and he was one of the ones who discovered fission along with his uh, uh, aunt, Lisa Meitner. Okay, so that's him. We have Harry Doglian. Actually, it should be Harry Doglian Jr., sorry about that. Louis Slotin, who's here. 
uh, and I'll talk more about them later. Otto Frisch actually conducted the first criticality tests of 235 uranium. Um, and these are uh, called the guillotine and coined by Feynman as tickling the dragon's tail. So tickling the dragon's tail is really for any of the criticality experiments that were done. Um, both Enrico Fermi and, Fe and Richard Feynman both warned uh, the group about these experiments. So there was a committee for planning there. He had to get basically experiments approved. And they said, OK, but these are really dangerous and that you'll be sorry. Okay? And boy, were they right for these two people and almost for this man as well. He almost died. Okay? So it was a very dangerous time because new elements, unknowns all over the place. So why, is, why, is, why are these criticality um, you know, experiments so dangerous? Are they worried about an explosion? Possibly, but that's not the biggest risk. The biggest risk is, as I said, something you can't hear, see, taste, generally speaking, until it's too late. And that's radiation. Okay, so ionizing radiation, right? So we're talking, we have high frequency, very low wavelength, right? Damages cells directly by breaking apart chemical bonds and generating free radicals, right? Either directly or indirectly by radiolysis of water, right? Generating free radicals. So our question is how is dose measured? How much is absorbed? At this time, did they really know that? I mean, I'd be amazed what they knew, right? Because again, it was completely unknown. They didn't even probably have very good detectors. Right, especially for alpha radiation is, I know, one of the more difficult ones, and we'll talk about that a little later. Is anyone familiar with the four cookies? So the four cookies, so you have an alpha cookie, a beta cookie, a gamma cookie, and a neutron cookie. Physicists? I assume so, I don't. So okay, so basically you're given these four cookies and you're told, okay, you gotta eat one, you gotta put one in your pocket, you hold one and you throw one away. Okay, so which one would you want to throw away? Do you think? Physicists are allowed to answer. I mean, really, it shouldn't say all of them. Why would you eat a regular cookie in the first place? Actually, no, it's not gamma. Alpha. Alpha. You've got, you've got, you've got to eat one though. Don't ingest the neutron. Yeah, you don't ingest the neutron one, and you don't uh, ingest the alpha one. Sorry. Is what causes ionizing radiation. It's what actually radiates. I think. I mean, I put a beta in my pocket. So. Yes, beta goes in your pocket, right? Because it, it can be affected by light shielding, right? So this is a very, very thin piece of metal. So that, so it, it can be easily shielded. Which one would you want to hold in your hand? What's the least? Alpha, right? So alpha, you definitely want to hold in your hand. You do not want to eat that because it's basically like a giant. A boiling ball of charge, right? We'll just knock out everything. Gamma is the one that you want to eat because who cares, right? It's going to go through you anyway. That's too bad, right? Neutron is the one you want to throw away. Now, neutron can be stopped by water, right? So anything that has a lot of hydrogens in it, right, will absorb neutrons, okay, um, and slow them down, okay? So you have to consider the types of radiation that you're dealing with. There's different types of describing doses, so rads and grays, right? So one gray is 100 rads. I think this is an SI unit, and, and the others, I think, are CGS units. Uh, death, the lethal dose, and what this means is 50% chance of death over 30 days is about 4.5 grays. With heavy intervention, it's 10 grays. Now, there's been improvements, right, in more recent times of including weighting factors. So it depends, again, the four cookies depends on the type of radiation. So gamma and x-rays and betas have actually very low weighting factors. Neutrons, depending on their energy, can be high or low. And actually, when you get to high energies again, it actually decreases again. And that has to do with the cross, uh, capture cross-section of fast versus thermal neutrons. And alpha particles are bad, bad, bad. So you do not want uh, at those anywhere in you, especially, or breathed in or anything. You also have to consider the weighting factor of the organs that are affected. Now, if you get a whole body dose, I mean, that's just one, that's too bad, right? But if it's directed, it depends on where it is. So reproductive organs, right? Bone marrow, the stomach, it are really affected. Any cell that is fast dividing is more affected by radiation than slowly dividing cells. So actually, like, your, your uh, neuro, neuro system is fine. Like, uh, that's actually the least affected. In fact, if you get those symptoms, you you've gone way over the limit for radiation. Like it's just, you're dead, basically. Um, skin is not as affected as it's like the surface of bone is not as affected because those are very slowly dividing. And those are sieverts. So you multiply gray by these different weighting factors to get your dose in sievert. And so I'm gonna show you some estimated doses just to give you an idea. So 10, bad, okay, you're dead. 
right? Anything over that, anything less than that, it's it can be, you know, you have chance, you have a chance of survival. Okay, so the first criticality accident was group leader Otto Frisch. So he was trying to find the amount needed for criticality for 235 uranium using fast neutrons, right? Because for a bomb, you're going to have to take advantage of those fast neutrons because it's got to be a fast process for an explosion. So he stacked these uranium hydride bricks to determine what criticality was about re reached. He was leaning over, and his body, which you're made of, water, started moderating, reflecting back neutrons. And he noticed that a lamp that was beside him, instead of flickering like kind of slowly, started just lighting up continuously. He was like, oh, poop. And he like got out of the way and assembled it right away. Right? So he received about 25 rads. That's the best estimate I could find. If he had been a couple seconds later, he would have received a fatal dose of radiation. He would have died. He was also the one who developed the dragon experiment. So as a uranium-235 slug that goes through kind of like this like hollowed out sphere. And so it reaches criticality when it goes right through the middle and comes out again. And these are, it's called Lady Godiva because it's unshielded, right? And so there were a couple criticality accidents with this in the 50s, um, but they didn't, it didn't kill anyone because by that time they had better safety um, rules because of the reasons I'm going to mention in a few minutes. Okay, so this was all to test the gadget. So as Dr. Sawyer pointed out last week, right, the Trinity test was needed because they were very confident of a gun type assembly working for uranium, but plutonium, there are a lot more issues. Again, plutonium is a new element, right? So you have to take that into account. And so at the time, though, there's more 239 plutonium available than 235 uranium, which is also fissile. So this is a gadget test, which used a, again, implosion type bomb of plutonium. And who was there? But two of the subjects of today's talk, Harry Daglian and Louis Lott. Okay? So they were both there constructing the gadget. And by the way, it's the gadget throughout documents. So that server document that I told you about from 1943, they call it the gadget. And they have code names for the different elements as well. So they don't call it plutonium-239, they call it like 49. So that brings us to after the end of the war, right? So the two bombs, um, Little Boy and Fat Man, were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, they, Japan surrendered August 15, 1945. There was a third bomb, and it actually it was processed, I think, August 13th and ready August 16th. So if it hadn't been, like, this day, there's a chance that it could have been used, actually. So it was, like, a couple days, kind of, just in range. Each bomb cost $500 million. That's 1940s dollars, and so I found sources that said today with inflation, that's $8.5 billion for each wow. bomb. Your tax dollars at work. Or your grandparents' tax dollars, great grandparents' tax dollars ever. <laughs> so what happened to that third bomb? Okay, so that third plutonium core was taken to Hanford, Washington for repurposing for scientific study. Because why not? We got this shiny bomb, a shi shiny metal ball, and uh, we have nothing to do with it now. There's no war. Okay, so the core pit was nicknamed Rufus <laughs> and was sent to Los Alamos National Lab. So that's its origin name, right? It's, it's Rufus. Okay, so that's Hanford, Washington. So that was a big pl uh, plutonium processing site. Oak Ridge as well, the white 12 plant, I believe, also made plutonium as well and sent to Los Alamos. And that's why it's called Rufus. I just thought that would, would be, they would totally do something like that, just like they had like the Enola Gay or whatever, just give a little dog stamp. Okay, so what was Rufus exactly? So we already know it's plutonium, okay. Um, so it actually was not pure plutonium, it's actually plutonium gallium alloy, okay? And the reason it had to be, and it had a ring in between, and the ring has to do with something beyond me, it's like neutron flux or something, that was not present in the Trinity device, the gadget. Um, that plutonium sphere was also coated, almost like a chocolate egg, with a layer of nickel to inhibit corrosion, okay? And oxidation, okay? Um, so I just, want to point this out because this is plutonium as I said is a new element so if we look at the periodic table where it is right so plutonium there is it is actually there's trace amounts that are naturally occurring there is a natural reactor in, in Africa right that actually is undergoing nuclear reactions and so there's trace amount of plutonium naturally present but it's primarily an artificial element okay so plutonium is incredibly complicated it has six allotropes of plutonium so different densities, right? Different ductilities, malleabilities, all that kind of stuff, okay? So there's a huge problem, okay? 
we have to stabilize a version that's easy to machine and mold into the ideal shape for criticality, right? And so unfortunately, that shape is actually face-centered cubic, so 281, right? Now that's actually important because that's actually why it's malleable. So that's the delta phase here. But you'll notice where that delta phase is stable. Um, I don't know, I looked at the weather today. It's not uh, 500 to 700 Kelvin out, okay? So how did they stabilize this? That's where the gallium comes in, okay? So they actually figured out that they could use about max, I think 3% mole, well, 3 mole percent gallium in order to stabilize the, this delta phase over the alpha phase, which should be stable at room temperature. The alpha phase is also more dense than the delta phase. So why do you think that's important? Which one would be a better critical mass? A more dense phase, more dense phase. Yeah, so actually when it implodes, it actually goes from this phase to that phase, which is even better, okay, which is pretty neat. So this phase is stabilized with addition of that gallium, okay? So one of the important things is that this is stabilized um, at room temperature by the addition of gallium. Now, gallium was not the first choice. Does anyone know what the first choice was for, for alloying? It was aluminum, right? So if we look at the periodic table, yeah, yeah. yeah one up is aluminum. Why do you think aluminum is a problem? So it absorbs alpha particles and then gives off neutrons, right? And you don't want that. You don't want spontaneous neutrons coming off because that will lead to a fizzle, right? So a little spontaneous fission, that's a problem. So uh, they went with gallium, which proves superior. And one of the things I actually forgot to mention was that critical assemblies group, when they were doing those experiments, there were two other people there. So Philip Morrison was one of them, who Dr. Sawyer pointed out was on the crutches driving the bomb. Another person was uh, the local spy, Klaus Fuchs, was also there. And that's important because uh, this was actually the, one of the big tricks he gave the Soviets was the plutonium gallium alloy, right? That really uh, allowed them to get there quickly in terms of de developing bomb. Okay. So that's pretty cool. So plutonium has all these complicated uh, complexities to it, multiple oxidation states, completely different from the, uh, the lanthanides, by the way, chemically, just crazy. Okay, the core was subcritical on its own, right? So if you just had the core, you could hold it in your hand. Right, gloved hand, hopefully. Um, and it was described as minus five cents, right? So if it's zero, that's criticality. And I'm gonna, not gonna pretend I totally understand this because there's dollars and cents, and they're often in terms of time, like time to reach a critical mass, it's kind of weird. So the plutonium assembly, as I said, was actually fairly small, but it's, it's still dense even in the delta phase, right? With a mass of 14 pounds, and it's 14 pounds is actually important for us, we think about Rufus, well, maybe me personally, maybe you, Dr. Sawyer, because that would be two Buddy Sawyer equivalents, okay? So two, of, uh, two buddies equals one demon core, or Rufus, that's what we know for now. Okay, so let's talk about the accidents, all right, that, ha that happens, okay? So uh, his name was Harrowtoon Harry Precor Daglian Jr. He was born in 1921 in Waterbury, Connecticut, so I just want to give you a sense. He was a grad student at the time. He was not a senior scientist. He was, he was basically a kid. He was admitted to MIT to study math, but became interested in particle physics, and he transferred to Purdue. Okay. Um, so he continued graduate work at Purdue and was then recruited by Otto Frisch. And again, as I said, this is another picture of him. He was present at the Trinity site and as a student and helped to assemble the bomb, which is crazy. So on August 21st, 1945, so this is literally like five days after that core went to Los Alamos, six days after the surrender, um, he was doing experiments to determine the point of criticality using a neutron reflector. In this case, these are tungsten carbide bricks that he was putting on one on top of another, one on top of another. So he had, throughout the day, um, he had done the experiment. He actually had a successful experiment. So in the afternoon, did it, proper protocol, everything just about reached criticality, he was still alive, not irradiated, and he was like, great. For some reason, he came back at night alone. And he was like, what if I just add one more brick, one more layer, okay? So as he was about to add that final brick, neutron counters warned him, hey, this is gonna go super critical, like this is bad. And he was, he was about to withdraw his hand and he dropped it, maybe because he was scared and he just shook and freaked out and he felt a tingling sensation and saw a blue glow about two inches deep. 
That blue glow is Cherenkov radiation. And what that is, is when charged particles go faster than the speed of light in a given medium. Okay, so like water or air or something. Okay, that's what he saw. He received a dose of 510 Runkin equivalent man, I think that's what that stands for, which is five. So these are all estimates. So there, there's some that are around this, but 5.1 is basically what I found of neutrons and, and gamma radiation. Okay. Um, he fell into a coma and died 25 days later. I'm going to describe his clinical course in a bit. But the sad thing is, is that other than going back and doing that experiment, right, which he just should not have done, right? He already had a successful experiment. Uh, but the other thing is, is if he, uh, there's some talk that he had, uh, he took some time to disassemble it. If he hadn't done that, he probably would have survived. Like the initial like critical burst didn't actually kill him. Like he would have survived after that. But because he went and kind of disassembled everything. So he was not the only one there though. There's also security guard reading this paper thinking, well, I don't know what this guy's doing, but whatever, right? And just <laughs> reading it. And uh, that security guard also got hit by like about, I mean, it was much less than what Harry Doglian got. Private Robert J. Hemerly, he did die 33 years later at the age of 62 from leukemia, which they do attribute to the radiation that he received at that accident. Okay, so, um, I'm going to say this, this is out of respect for, I mean, because uh, this is pretty sad what happened. He wanted this, so Harry Daglin, when he was in the hospital for 25 days, he did want it documented what happened to him, right? So, so people could see, right? So this was his hand that was disassembling. It's just blistered, like all get out, okay? So it's just crazy, right? So that was nine days after the accident. This is his, the trunk of his body. It's basically all, it's basically a sunburn is what it is. And it's just sloughed off, like a bunch of his skin just sloughed off. Okay, so it was just really bad. He was hit by vomiting, um, gastrointestinal, just illness like crazy, so diarrhea, all that kind of stuff, right? Because as we said, the, the stomach, gastrointestinal system is most affected by radiation. It's the fastest dividing cells. So that's why a lot of the symptoms that you know you see, right? If you watch Chernobyl, what happened? They vomited, right? Diarrhea, all that kind of stuff. That's what happens with acute radiation syndrome or radiation sickness. Right, and so he then went into a coma and he died. Okay, tighter safety rules were put in place. We'll see how successful those were in a bit. Um, while in hospital, Daglin was visited by Louis Slotin, who had first-hand account of someone that that died. So there is a memorial to Harry Daglin. I think this is in New London, Connecticut, dedicated to him and his memory. Because as I said, he was just a student at the time. Right? And what's kind of scary is he was a student who was doing like a super dangerous experiment that people knew were da was dangerous. Okay, so that brings us to Lewis Lawton. So things were moved, okay, at that time to another plant. But who was Lewis Lawton? He was actually Canadian chemist physicist from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Okay, he earned degrees at University of Manitoba and King's College in London. He was an amateur boxer while at King's College and won the Bantamweight Championship. Uh, he came to the US to work with cyclotrons. Um, so now kind of, he had spun some tales too about like working for the Royal Air Force and stuff like that and things, things like that in, in um, the Spanish Civil War, I think it was, like, and they weren't true. Uh, but he did have a failure, fairly cavalier attitude towards safety. And so there are some stories that I saw, including when he was at Oak Ridge, that apparently there's a reactor, he, there needed a repair to be done on a reactor. And they're like, well, we're gonna have to turn it off and let it cool, and then you can, you know, they can go in and repair it. And that was, but it'll have to be shut down over the weekend. So on Monday, the supervisor comes back and sees everything's repaired. He had gone down there, the reactor was not turned off, and just stripped down, no dosimeter or anything, so no idea how much radiation he got, and he fixed it and then came back. Um, so they say with the dose that he likely got, like he was at the edge of getting some acute radiation sickness, but not quite, so he was fine. So maybe that, but, so someone said he was a good experimental scientist, but he was quite a, a cowboy. Um, so at this time, he was also, well, after kind of the war had finished and, and with Harry Doglin's death and everything, and probably even before that, but more so the war, he was kind of disenchanted with the whole Manhattan Project. He didn't like kind of the results, you know, so they had seen acute radiation sickness in Japan, right, after the dropping of the bombs and everything. So he was about to leave. He had sent in a resignation, and on that fateful day on May 21st, he was actually training his replacement. It was his final experiment. So he was training Alvin C. Graves. So uh, Harry Dogley and Jr. was using 
uh, tungsten carbide bricks, whereas now Louis Lawton is using beryllium, right, as a neutron reflector. So this is what the demon core was, so it's plutonium, and you had this, these hemispheres of beryllium over top. He used a screwdriver to keep the hemispheres separate. So um, the avocado example wasn't the greatest, because there's actually a hole on top of the beryllium tamper reflector. And so he was holding it with that one hand, and then he had a screwdriver in the other hand that he was keeping the hemispheres apart with. There are safety shims, and they were there, but then some stories have said, uh, said that he removed them. So basically what happened was um, at 320, he dropped the screwdriver, the mass went critical, blue glow scene, slot and felt heat, so that's also what Harry Dogman Jr. felt as well. And he also had a sour taste in his mouth as well that he reported at the time. So, um, so actually, one of the, the things is Slotin was, was kind of just a very interesting individual. And so after that had happened, he said, well, that does it. No. That's literally just what he said. Well, that does it. Um, and that's kind of his, his, he was kind of, he seemed like a pretty funny guy. Uh, when he was kind of trying to leave, right, he said, I've become involved in the Navy test much to my dismay. He was actually supposed to go to Bikini Atoll where they were going to start Operation Crossroads. So he's going to go there and put together some devices. He said, I have become one of the few people left here who are experienced bomb putter togetherers. <laughs> okay, so Slot was not alone in that case. Unlike Harry Dobbin, who had that poor security guard, right? There are other people in the room as well, seven others, including Dogland. And so they had them, uh, so Lewis Slot or some other people, I can't remember exactly what the, the true story is, but they all marked where they were when the accident occurred. And so Slotin was closest, 1.5 feet away. Graves was three feet away. There's other scientists, young Klein Cleary, who died in the Korean War. Um, Sislicki, and then a couple others who were much further away and suffered no ill effects. You also notice some other things in this room. So there is a radium beryllium neutron source. There is a also polonium beryllium um, source as well, which, yeah, so all these neutron sources are also present in the room. Right, so James Chadwick's experiment, I think, was with the polonium beryllium source. So all this other stuff was in the room as well. Um, and so what happened to some of these other people? There are whole documents, by the way, about them following the other survivors for like decades after what happened to them. So Alvin Graves, he survived for 20 years. He actually, after the accident, had only a 50% chance of survival. He got that much radiation. Like, he lost a bunch of his hair, so this was actually um, a cool article from the BBC about it. He lost his hair, some of it grew back, some of it did not. He ended up dying with an enlarged heart and an atrophied thyroid. Some of that they do attribute to radiation, but it's hard to say because his father also died of a heart, heart condition as well. Zislicki died from acute myeloid leukemia at the age of 32, so fairly young, so they also believe that's radiation induced. Young, who was another person that was there, another scientist, died 27 years later at the age of 83 uh, from aplastic anemia and a bacterial infection. So that has to do with when, I believe, you're not creating any more um, blood cells from your bone marrow, I think. And Graves, Klein, and Perlman sued, actually, in 1948 as a result of this <coughs> acumen, uh, accident. And Graves received a whopping $45,000 in today's dollar settlement. It was only like $3,400. That's what he got for almost dying. And what about Louis Slotin? So he did not die right away. It took him nine days. So immediately after leaving the room, Slotin vomited. Again, it's that whole gastrointestinal, right? That's where radiation tends to affect the most. Exposed to 21 sieverts um, of neutrons or gammas, x-rays. So one thing about a lot of radiation sickness is it will seem that you get better um, and then you get worse. And so he appeared to get better, he was in good spirits, but then after day four, his symptoms worsened. He had major gastrointestinal distress fever over 103 degrees Celsius every day, lost lymphocytes, so white blood cell basically just gone, right? So he was just very, very sensitive to any sort of infection. Low platelet count, he was hemorrhaging, okay? So internally. Um, the doctors basically said that he had 3D sunburn. That's basically how they described it. So terribly painful. And there's his hands that you can see just basically swollen and just color just drained from a blue essentially, and he died nine days later. He got a larger dose than Harry Donovan did. Now this has actually been dramatized in Hollywood. So this was, has anyone seen this movie? Um, I think it's called Fat Man and Little Boy. Let's see if it, 
think the is on volume. So this is kind of an agglomeration of both the uh, Lewis Lawn and the Harry Doglian uh, scenarios. It's tiny. some fission product products, right? Probably built up some plutonium 240 at the same time. Maybe also warped, right? So remember I told you about the delta and the alpha, right? Um, I, uh, allotropes of plutonium. 115 degrees Celsius you can convert from the delta to the alpha, right? So it gets hot enough and you do not want the alpha. It's actually not, not great in terms of machining. So, um, so after it had cooled down though, they found it was okay and they, it was gonna be used in test shot test shot Charlie. Um, Charlie was canceled. So if anyone is familiar with like the tests that they did back in the day, uh, Baker was disastrous. So that was the first underwater nuclear test they did and it created way more radioactivity than they had imagined. And they're like, you know what? Nope, we're not doing another one, at least for a while. And so then what happened was that it was eventually melted down in the summer of 1946. So that's basically how Rufus became the demon core where it didn't get to spend its vacation uh, on the beautiful, destroying the beautiful uh, beaches in uh, Polynesia. Okay, so we're, uh, we're close to the end of the talk, so that was a demon core, but that's not the end of criticality accidents. There is another one I do want to actually tell you about, which is actually even worse. And it didn't involve any bomb core, it actually involved a mixer. So this was Cecile Kelly, he was a chemical operator at Los Alamos National Lab. Um, no worry about uh, any of those open metal assemblies because all of the criticality tests were done remotely. So even when Lady Godiva went, uh, uh, underwent an excursion, it didn't matter because people were away. So they had extraction set up for extracting plutonium solutions. So we have to recycle material right, that you've used. And one of the ways of doing that is actually taking uranium and plutonium and putting them in an organic phase because they can actually bind to uh, certain compounds to actually be organic soluble and all the waste is washed away in the aqueous phase. So it's basically for us kind of like a giant <coughs> separatory model. Okay? Um, but what happened was he actually got a concentration of solution that was had too much plutonium in it. And so initially when it was at rest it did not reach a critical mass but then as soon as you turned that spinner on you actually had enough critical, uh, critical mass. It was only about like I think 3.2 kilograms, I think, total of plutonium was in the entire thing that actually set this off. And he was actually looking at it through, there's a viewing port up here, and it knocked, he saw the blue flash, knocked him off his feet, he started screaming, I'm burning up, I'm burning up. He had received more neutrons and gammas 
than um, either Lewis Slotin or Harry Dogland. He got way more. So Lewis Slotin was 21. This guy's 45. He died within 35 hours after the event. And he died actually of heart failure from it. But he was basically gone. So you don't even need a bomb to actually have a criticality accident. And actually, the worst one, Wood Junction um, accident, 100. Right? So it was even worse. Right? And in more recent times, um, there actually had a near miss at Los Alamos. So this was a photo op of 239 plutonium fuel rods. And this was in a glove box. These are all, I didn't realize this at first, but these all look like they're propped up. So there should not be this much critical material. <laughs> Very close to one another, right? So someone had just taken it, they thought it was a cool picture, like, hey, look what we made, you know, kind of thing. And uh, supervisors saw what was going on, told the personnel to separate them, but that was dangerous because one, they told everyone to continue working in the room. But as we know from Otto Frisch's case, right, your body can reflect back neutrons in acting as a neutron moderator. So just by disassembling things, you can actually cause a criticality event, okay? So that was all these safety issues kind of, and that's why they do not process actually plutonium for, for warheads or anything like that anymore at Los Alamos, as of like last year. That's when I kind of, this was a whole um, issue in science um, talking about all these issues at National Labs of Criticality Safety, especially with these elements. Of course, there's also chemical hazards and other radiological hazards as well, um, including shipping of radioactive materials, which I always worry about because it's like, man, what if someone puts things too close together? You know, it's crazy. So, as I said, this has actually kind of become of recent interest, and I'll explain why on kind of the final slide. So, it's been a source of memes recently. Um, and the origin of, of, of these is, uh, is actually some videos that have come out that are really good. So I use a lot of resources when like researching this because again, radiation is really cool. Who thinks it's really cool? I do, yeah, yeah. Especially neutrons are very neat. I never want to encounter one, except for the one, uh, uh, aside from the very, very small amount we get from cosmic rays, okay? I'm fine with those. But anything else, no thank you. Uh, so here's some good resources. So especially this Demon Core by Kyle Hill. Kyle Hill does a lot of cool stuff with like about radiation and criticality, so it is plainly difficult. And I think those are why it's kind of become of interest, uh, especially to you know, younger uh, people who are like you know, you know um, starting university or even before. Um, plutonium, if you want to read more about the chemistry of plutonium and how it's, I didn't even get to scratch the surface of how crazy it is, right? And just to think about how they took a new element that had multiple oxidation states, <coughs> multiple allotropes, and managed to safely, and this is what I can't believe, is how did they not have a criticality accident before when they were actually making it? Like, how? how? I, I just, I don't know. Um, uh, other kind of good resources um, that have to do more with, uh, you know, some of the lives of some of these people. And I will have to also point out, so there is uh, on MIT Open Courseware, there are a series of videos about nuclear engineering ionizing radiation. I actually got there from looking at Chernobyl stuff and uh, by Professor Michael Short, and they're actually really good. So if you're interested in this, physics students, chemistry students, go check these out. They're, they're pretty amazing. You'll learn a lot. Okay, so with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Symmetry in, in the room where the Stalin or the slot and accident happened. That that looks remarkably like an experimental hall after the radiation control people go in and they measure how much radiation all the hot spots in the room have. And that's those are the maps that people as like regular workers like us experimenters, we gotta follow this map and make sure we say, you know, there's twenty paces away from this place. So Yeah, that's neat. Well, they weren't wearing dosimeters, actually, at the time. And they were like, uh, locked up away in like these drawers, and they had to get them out after. But they were useless after. But it looks like that's something that was used in court for the case, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But maybe, yeah, yeah, exactly, for the lawsuit. That this happened. position uh, outside. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. There's a question. When you were talking about uh, swapping, yeah. did you mean 103 Fahrenheit or 103 Celsius? Oh, sorry, 103 Fahrenheit. I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Celsius. <laughs> sorry, that was that was me. 103 Fahrenheit. Yeah, that I mean, he he spontaneously like, <laughs> 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 Yeah, 
<laughs> so, you know, you, you mentioned the terrain call radiation, right? Uh -huh. And uh, I, I guess, you know, probably what people don't realize is when he sees the blue glow, uh -huh. blue glow is not out there. Yeah. Blue glow is inside the vitreous humor of his eyes. Yeah, that's, yeah. So that's the particles traveling through creating those cones of terrain call radiation. Yeah. So, because they say that people actually see that sometimes when they're getting like certain therapies. They, and, they, and I've heard stories of these old cyclotron guys who could, like, you know, put their heads in the beam line until they saw the blue glow and oh, okay, that's where the beam's coming through. But, um, <laughs> I don't know how I heard that. People were built differently back then. I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> well, not a cancer, right? I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like Enrico Fermi died like pretty young and, yeah. you know, everything. And his two of his students, they think it's from working on the pile. I mean, I, that I, that is a, sadly, I mean, you know, when you're, I'm looking at Nevin here because, you know, we have the medical physics stuff, and, and we, when you're thinking about what are the effects of radiation, well, all, all the information we have are from Brad, folks like Louis Lawton, and, you know, and, and it's, you know, people who were in accidents, yeah. uh, the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, I guess in accents, you can also include Chernobyl and Fukushima uh, more recently. And then patients undergoing radiation therapy, but they're not really good models because they have cancer or sick right now. Exactly. Sick already. So, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to tease out from, from these sort of cases what the effects are. Yeah, and that's actually Michael Short. He actually pointed out that thing. Is he's like, one of the reasons we just can't really model a whole lot of stuff is, I hope I'm paraphrasing him correctly, but that is because a lot of like Chernobyl and stuff like that, you can't really get a whole lot of data because there's just not a large sample size yeah. to say, you know, that you know, there's, I think, around 30 people that died of like, or, you know, they can definitely say, but even that, they don't exactly know, right? I guess Hiroshima and Nagasaki are kind of the two cases where you do have a large kind of group. But yeah, like a lot but, of these but, other accidents. But very early techniques. A, a, exactly, yeah. But in the case of explosion of the bomb, like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's hard also to distinguish who died of radiation and who died of chemical uh, uh, product of radiation. So yeah. it, we don't know, nobody knows actually how dangerous radiation is. We are pretending it's very dangerous. But for example, you mentioned 30 grades. Yeah. They give cancer pa patients uh, 70 grades, and they still live after that. Mm -hmm. It's it's <coughs> maybe it's because it's local or it's a different. It depends how fast. It's actually a few years ago I read uh, yeah. another record holder. So there is a, this person I don't remember his name, but he ingested radioactive material. So through his entire life, he got 10,000 grades. Oh, swap. <laughs> and he, he basically died eight years old. No, no, it's, we don't know much about, I mean, we know it's dangerous. And of course, if you stay next to this uh, ball, you are going to die. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's not a, a question. But now, those people who yeah, are rich aside, who knows? They could have died in 10 days, months, maybe years. So if it's given on small doses, like this homeopathy, right? If the body is uh, going to cope with it. <laughs> but if it's big doses. Yeah, I guess it's just like it's a time. Like just other student questions? So you mentioned Harvey's experience in Chicago. I've yeah. heard that he, he, his lab was under the football stadium. Yeah, yeah. And he had the football players to move the heavy blocks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting. I, in fact, I saw a story that it wasn't even supposed to be there, and then I think they got like emergency position, uh, like uh, ability to like do it because of wartime efforts and stuff. So this is a question to whoever remembers. My memory is terrible. That movie, The Little Boy and Fat Man. I thought in the movie the timeline is wrong, right? It they is. They were leading up to the Trinity. Exactly. Yeah. They that's they took a lot of artistic license. Yeah. So it was. Yeah, it wasn't quite the same. And his name was like John Merriman, I think, or something like that. Yeah, so it was kind of a composite character. Actually, in the 60s and 70s, it was very difficult to put the uh, research nuclear reactors in the universities. For example, Purdue, in my own, back in Bulgaria, it's 
whatever the, the main building is on the ground is that you could read the one. They, they were basically the story was look how easy it is for us to get access to the new The students were eager to show them around and without even asking who they were. How they teach in nuclear physics, right? <laughs> 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 Nothing else. I just thank our speaker again. Yeah.